Thus have I heard. In the first watch of the night, the Buddha reflected on all things, how they come in and out of being. In the middle watch of the night, he recalled his past lives. Then, in the hour before dawn, his eyes fell upon the morning star, triggering the great enlightenment. At long last, the Buddha knew the truth of all existence. He had broken the endless cycle of death and rebirth. Tibetan monastery on the plains of South India, a long way from the high Himalayas. And in that monastery, a household awaiting the return of its master, not from a journey afar, but from death itself. Kyabje Song Rinpoche, High Lama of the Galupa sect of Tibetan Buddhism, departed from this earth in 1984 on a date he had marked in his diary seven days before. These days, the bells on his stupa are rarely silent. The arrival of his next incarnation is considered imminent. Song Rinpoche was one of hundreds of individuals in Tibetan Buddhism called tulkus. It's said they can reincarnate at will, that they practice the little-known yoga that lets them control the subtlest energies of life, and as a consequence, the process of death and rebirth. Our knowledge of the esoteric practices of Tibet has only come about in the last few decades, an aftermath of the tragedy of the Tibetan nation. 1959, a popular uprising is brewing against the Chinese occupation of Tibet. The Dalai Lama, political and spiritual leader of the Tibetan people, decides to go into exile. His hope is that this will prevent a bloodbath. In a remarkable act of faith, a million Tibetans try to follow him across the Himalayas to India. A few hundred thousand make it. Hidden from the eyes of the world, countless thousands will die of starvation as China systematically begins the obliteration of Buddhist culture. To the south, in India, the Dalai Lama establishes a government in exile. Plots of subtropical jungle are acquired, the land cleared, and the replanting of Tibetan culture on Indian soil begun. In the southern state of Karnataka, the great monasteries have been rebuilt. Drepung and Ganden are three kilometers apart. Each has over a thousand monks, a far cry from the numbers they had in Tibet. But after 30 years of exile, a good start. There's no shortage of young monks here. Most Tibetan families will still have one son become a monk. And over the last few years, hundreds of small children have been shipped out of Tibet on the underground railways, most of them taken in by the monasteries. They enter a demanding educational system. If they show talent and aptitude, they can earn a geshe degree in Buddhist philosophy and become highly respected teachers. But at the top of the monastic system are the tulkus, the high lamas who are believed to reincarnate from life to life. When I was very small, I used to pile up rice and say, this is my monastery. You see, the translation of the name Jebu Monastery means pile of rice. Kegyu Rinpoche was born to an Indian family. He was discovered to be a Tibetan tulku through a strange experience. When I was two and a half years old, I fell off a four-story building. And although I fell from such a height, I had no broken bones or even any bruises. When I was falling, I had the impression that a lady wearing Tibetan clothes was waiting to catch me with her apron raised and falling into her lap. But later we found there was no lady, just a pile of broken concrete where I had fallen. And um, I was sitting on my bed, and I started to just have these sort of recollections. Jatsi Rinpoche grew up in Montreal. When he was three, an encounter with a visiting lama seemed to trigger very specific memories of a past life. Uh, 
my teacher's name, what it was like where I stayed, friends' names, and, uh, what I used to do, where I used to, you know, I called it uh, my planet. You know. At age 14, Jatsi came to India to start learning Tibetan. He now lives at Sarah Jay, the monastery of his previous incarnation. And people sometimes remark that he does bear a slight physical resemblance. The only thing that I have that they say is similar is from the half of the, this part of my nose to this part of my head. They say it's pretty much similar, except the color of my eyes. <laughs> The ability to remember past lives is intimately connected with the degree of the person's spiritual realization. The higher the realization, the more vivid the memories of past incarnations. Lati Rinpoche is the ex-abbot of Gandan Monastery and a highly respected scholar. In most cases, memories of previous lives happen when the person is very young and fade later in life. Sometimes, however, someone may retain memories of past incarnations but he may claim he doesn't remember anything out of modesty. The month of December is treasured in South India. The weather is close to perfect, no suffocating heat and no soaking rains. But this December is special for a different reason. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is here, giving a public teaching for the entire month. Every afternoon, people from the nine surrounding Tibetan villages put on their best clothes and join the monks to trek down the road to Drepung to hear the lamb rim of Tsongkhapa, the commentary on the gradual path to full enlightenment. A path that some seem more happy to ride than to walk. His Holiness Tenzin Gyatso, Ocean of Wisdom, the 14th incarnation of the Dalai Lamas of Tibet. He has traveled widely for the cause of his people, bringing a message of peace and nonviolence wherever he goes. And he's become much revered around the world for his kind manner and his easy sense of humor. You're now the 14th incarnation of the same southern mind. <laughs> um, of your past incarnations, do you feel closer to some than others? And if so, why? Um, naturally, I think, you see, uh, among the last the 13 Dalai Lamas, the first Dalai Lama was most I'd say, f uh, f favorite to me. Because, you see, uh, I'm not only a great scholar, but very good practitioner, pra very good practitioner. And, I would say, the way of his, I would say, I think conduct is very gentle, very, very quiet type person, it seems. Then the second Dalai Lama, also, you see, very great scholar and non-sectarian, very strict non-sectarian, very good, very good scholar. And then fifth, Dalai Lama. Very good. Are there any of the incarnations that you don't like at all? <laughs> that, that, no use, Kasuri. No use to develop such feeling. That's foolish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are, you see. To have some, you see, more respect. Some, yes, good. That's all. <laughs> that kind of, you see, attitude. <laughs> At the household of Song Rinpoche, this December will be remembered for another reason. The long search for his next incarnation is almost over. Tenzin Wangchuk is Song Rinpoche's chanso, which is like a personal attendant, but the job has an added weighty responsibility. After the Tulku's death, the chanso must organize the search for the next incarnation. 1984, Stong Rinpoche's cremation. An oracle has already determined he will be born to a Tibetan family in India or Nepal within two years. When they open the cremation stupa, what looks like a small footprint is found under the ashes. 
an indication to the monks that he will soon take rebirth. Two years later, the search begins. Tenzin Wangchuk crisscrosses the subcontinent, interviewing 500 children. Pictures with special boys and some, some interesting boys. And this is in Shimla. Uh, this is in Masuri, Uttar Pradesh. And this is also Manali Kulu, which uh, is, seems very smart boy. In which way is he special? Uh, he, special because he, uh, when we are there, he likes so much for us. Also, he says uh, he likes to go to the, with us, with the and to go to the monastery, he says, again and again, and, and seems to cry. And then when we take the bus, again his father took me to the bus station, and he says he wished to go to the monastery, and he says there is a monastery. Of the 500 children, 31 are considered possibles. Among these is Tenzin Trinley, age four. His parents sent him out of Tibet on the Underground Railway, and he ended up on the doorstep of Song Rinpoche's house. He soon began to display some unusual qualities. He knew complicated prayers and ritual hand gestures, things that would have been impossible to know without some kind of high-level instruction. Song Rinpoche traveled widely and had many students in the West. In fact, the wall of one room in his house is decorated with the architectural wonders of two of his favorite places, Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, and a distant metropolis where he intended to set up a center for advanced Buddhist studies in his next lifetime. Towards the end of his life, Song Rinpoche began collecting toys whenever he traveled. One day, Rinpoche told me he liked to go to, to buy toys. Then I told him, uh, how you need to buy toys? What is using for that? Because it's difficult to carry me in back to India because there are a lot of stuff, so it's very difficult. And then Rinpoche told me, you shut up, you don't know anything. I have to go to buy toys. So I took to Rinpoche and then he watched each toys and he chose all these uh, toys. And then also he, he liked this very much. Because he liked to play with our small monks and says, please everybody watch this, how it is this club, you know? And then he push like this, and then everybody, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you think when, when his next incarnation comes back, you'll be able to be certain that it's the next incarnation because he's going yeah. to like these toys? Yeah, this likes this. He's, uh, he's preparing every these things, you know? His Holiness, Trejang Rinpoche, age six. In his last incarnation, the spiritual teacher of Song Rinpoche and junior tutor to the Dalai Lama. Trejang Rinpoche was one of the most influential masters of the last generation of Lamas born in Tibet. It's said that Song Rinpoche delayed his own passing until the new incarnation of his teacher could be found. This is Trejang Rinpoche's attendant the one who conducted the successful search. The search party, all smiles, emerging from the house where the new incarnation was discovered. The boy's father told them an astonishing story. He'd once admonished the child for drinking so much milk when they were so poor. To his amazement, the boy calmly informed him that he didn't have to worry, that he, the boy, had 10 cows, and Paulden was looking after them for him. Well, 10 happened to be the exact number of cows in Trejang Rinpoche's household and Paldon happened to be the name of his attendant. In the Galupa sect, a monk will study the philosophy of Buddhism for 20 to 30 years. This includes five to six hours of debate every day, morning and evening. Debates are an innovative solution to killing a few birds with one stone. The monks get intense drill in the fine points of Buddhist philosophy, they develop a razor-sharp mind, and they get physical exercise tossed in for good measure. The hand clapping and foot movements have subtle ritual meanings. The shoving and pushing simply mean, get out of the way, it's my turn. The last stages of scholastic study delve into understanding the most difficult doctrine in Buddhist philosophy, emptiness. The Buddha's profound enlightenment on the nature of reality. Emptiness, the notion that nothing exists of itself, 
that all things, including the self, are the effects of continuously changing causes. Things appear to exist as separate and distinct only because the mind, out of what Buddhists call primordial ignorance, tries to grasp hold of them. This is the ignorance that causes suffering, that creates the sense of separation, of I and not I, of past and future, when in reality there is but the play of one endless moment, shunyata, the void. After the completion of scholastic studies, the Lama can begin the tantric yogas. Here he learns to uproot the mental habits of endless lifetimes, to vanquish the great deceiver called ignorance. Eventually, he learns to control the subtlest energies of body and mind, and ultimately, to know the very root of consciousness, the subtle mind of emptiness that is not subject to birth or death. When we say human mind, the, the grosser level of mind, is it that? So long, human body is there, that mind is there. That body change is that mind all you see now, no more. So the more subtler level, you see that mind, now you see depart, separate, separation. So that is, you see, death. That state is the deepest, you see, level of consciousness, usually we call clear light. The tantric view is that death does not happen with the ceasing of the breath, but later with the dawning of the clear light. For a normal person, the clear light meditation lasts for a brief time. Then he enters the bardo, the intermediate state, where he wanders in confusion for up to 49 days. Finally, craving full existence, the person takes rebirth. This cycle of reincarnation continues endlessly until the person realizes enlightenment. For the tantric master, however, the experience of death is fully controlled. Because he has broken the chains of ignorance, he does not have to be reborn. But because he has immense compassion for those who still suffer, he takes the vow of the bodhisattva. As long as space remains there, as long as sentient being suffering is there, I will remain and serve as much as I can. You see, that kind of determination. Mid-December, approaching solstice, Tenzin Wangchuk has determined through an oracle that it's a good time to do divinations, to reduce the list of 31 candidates. The ceremonies will take place every morning and evening for three days. In Buddhism, it is believed that all that has been and all that will be exist in the present moment. Therefore, nothing happens completely by chance. Lati Rinpoche rotates a bowl containing balls of barley dough. Each ball has a slip of paper with a name inside. One pops out. In this way, the short list will drop from 31 to 6 over the next three days. Its contents will be kept secret from all but a handful of people, and it will be given to the Dalai Lama for the final divination. For this, the Dalai Lama will use the Nechung, the state oracle of Tibet. The Neichung medium preparing to go into trance behind the closed doors of the great temple at Drepung Gomung. In a short time, in a ceremony rarely witnessed by most monks, let alone outsiders, he will be possessed by Dorje Drugden, chief emissary of the Pehar Gyapo, for 1,300 years the spirit protectors of Tibetan Buddhism. There are hundreds of spirit protectors in Tibetan Buddhism. They have varying degrees of spiritual realization. 
Dorje Drugden, the Nechung, is considered fully enlightened. He is the personal protector of the Dalai Lamas. As a Buddhist, you see, uh, beside human, how to say, human being, or animals which we can, uh, exist on this planet, you see, there are a lot of you see, different certain beings. You see, some are compared with human beings, you see, formless. You see, different, different kind of, you see, very subtle body. Just like another world. <laughs> This is the 13th in the line of Nechung oracles. Each time an old oracle dies, a new one appears. The new oracle is always tested thoroughly. He will be asked to repeat verbatim what was said on specific dates through the previous medium. In the case of the Nechung, this testing is taken very seriously because no major decisions of state are taken without consulting him. In a short time, the medium's body will expand in girth by two inches. He will rise and dance about, wearing more than a hundred pounds of clothing and a massive hat that would instantly choke him to death if he wasn't in trance. The immense effort will markedly shorten his life. There is a sense of urgency in the air this morning. No one knows how long the protector will stay. The questions are from the abbots of the three great monasteries. Suddenly there is a loud commotion. Another person has gone into a spontaneous trance. A second spirit has come to pay homage to the Nechung. But the force of the possession has made his gestures appear wrathful. <laughs> then whatever possesses the second person disappears. The man, unconscious of what has happened, is helped away to recover. Outside, a thousand monks wait expectantly. Then the doors of the great temple open, and in a rare public appearance, Dorje Drugden, chief emissary of the spirit protectors of Tibet, rushes out to bless the multitudes. For many of the monks, this is the first time they've seen the nature, and they shove forward to get a closer look. <laughs> It's said that as his arm swings round, the protector radiates a powerful healing energy that's felt in the far corners of the courtyard. The kernels of grain he casts out are supposed to protect the bearer from harm, and the monks quickly scoop up every last one. Then a short dance, a swing of the sword, and the offerings of food are sanctified. Suddenly the protector is gone, the sagging body of the medium caught by his attendants. When the time is right, he will be asked to go into trance again. The Dalai Lama will request advice on the next incarnation of Song Rinpoche. But now the medium of the state oracle of Tibet is carried off. It will take him two weeks to recover. That afternoon, the monks and lay people will file past the assembled beggars at the gates of Drepung and fill the courtyard once more for the Dalai Lama's teaching 
and the gradual path to enlightenment. Those society or community who accept rebirth, then their, I think, attitude towards this this life may be more or the open. So those people who only think, you see, it's just this. Then if you see, you get something within this life, good. If fail, you see, there's no hope. Once you accept rebirth, then the end of this life is something like changing your clothes. So this is not real end. Later, in the waning light of the December afternoon, the thousand monks of Ganden Monastery will make their way back up the road. If they happen to glance through the gate of Song Rinpoche's house, they'll see a little boy, one of the candidates for his next incarnation, singing softly to his new toy, waiting for his friends to return from the teachings. And as the sun goes down, the great horns will blow, and the courtyards will resound to the enthusiastic shouts of the monks in debate. 